And uh, hello, I am Oz the Great and Powerful. Um, no, actually I'm not, but that's still a better introduction than the one I usually have. Um, hi, I'm Tad. You are with me. You belong to me for a little while anyway. Um, good to have you. Good to see you all in whatever shape or form that you may be. Um, and wherever in the world you may be, it's seven o'clock here in Northern California. Um, and uh, it's another time in other places, but it's all the same moment if you grasp my meaning. No, I'm not stoned or anything. I just thought I'd get spiritual for a second. Anyway, very good to see you all. Um, not a huge amount to report. Um, just, you know, living life, working on various things. Um, looking forward to reading. I did get this in today, which as you will notice is the same book that we're reading, except it is the trade paperback edition. Um, I don't know if they did all four. I got four boxes of books and only had time to open the topmost one, but I'm going to use this one because it will be a lot easier on my wrist. Um, much, much lighter. Uh, and God knows I can use the help. Um, so let me think anything else of interest to tell you about just the usual. We're just, you know, we're, we're, we're hunkered down. We're working. I'm working. I'm working on the books. I'm working on maps, working on navigators, children, et cetera, et cetera. Deb is working on her fabric art. Um, young people are working on various young people, things like college and, you know, stuff. Uh, yeah, there's not really a huge amount to report right at the moment. Um, so I won't waste a lot of time, uh, trying to make something out of nothing. Um, we are still in largely in pandemic mode, as I'm sure a lot of you are out there, which means, you know, we sort of, uh, we kind of cut our days to fit our needs. Um, and most of that tends to mean staying home. Um, but, you know, especially for me, there are worse things to have happen. Um, although even I'm getting a little cabin fever, as I think I said last week. Um, so every now and then I have to wander out and do something just to get out of the house, just to remind myself that there is, you know, um, a world outside of the, the environ in which we are currently living. Um, warm day today here. Um, I'm sorry if that's a painful subject for others of you out there. Um, I'm not saying it to make you feel bad about it. Um, we just had a very warm day and uh, I think all up and down the West Coast because I heard them talking about uh, that the Super Bowl might have very hot weather down in Los Angeles. Although I think they're playing, I think the new stadium is indoors or something. I'm not quite clear. I'm not... I mean, I know who's in the Super Bowl and all that, and I know it's actually maybe just ended. Um, I mean, I'm a sports fan, but, you know, I'm, I'm not so much of a sports fan that I'm going to throw a Super Bowl party unless my personal favorite team is in it. Um, and it's kind of become an overblown corporate spectacle anyway, you know, with the ads and the Super Bowl halftime shows and all that stuff. And eh, very seldom, although this apparently looks like it was a fairly good game or is a good game. Um, they're generally not <laughs> hugely exciting um, as spectacles of sports personship. Anyway, so that's going on and I'm just kind of casually ignoring it mostly. Um, and just because again, I've got stuff to do, I got work to do and I'm working. And so that's really it. I don't have a whole lot to share. I apologize. I wish I did. I wish I had some really cool news and I could say, oh, and by the way, um, you know, such and such a property is going to be made into a movie and, you know, uh, some exciting people just moved in next door and I just bought myself an expensive car, but none of those things are happening or going to happen. Well, I don't know. We might be lucky on a movie someday, but, um, <laughs> other than that, you know, you're, you're talking to a writer and with a very small ex set of exceptions, you know, um, which I know a couple of them, but you know, in general writers, you know, we, we don't make superstar money and we don't live superstar lives. Nevertheless, we are happy people because we're doing what we love to do and we have a huge amount of freedom and no complaints there. So, um, but 
it also means that sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those people who's out at the moment touring the world and getting to meet new people and see new places and things like that. So I am in the middle of the winter of pandemic discontent and it may, mostly means I'm sitting around or I'm reading or I'm watching videos or whatever um, or working or hanging out with the kids. So that's about the size of it. Before I read, let me check in and see who's with us tonight, or at least who has checked in to be said hello to. Um, where did the burgly bargly chat stream go? Chat, chat stream. Okay, there it is. Okay, so let's see who checked in. Um, I love these things they put in. Social comments display here. Click on them to showcase on stream. Anyway, um, I, these things are all amusing as hell. Greg, good to see you. Thank you for joining me. Kelly, you're still not recovered from the Funderling battle. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. That's a long, you're, you're, that's right. You're reading Shadow March or the Shadow March series. Um, well, I'm sorry to hear you're not recovered, but I hope that's in a good way. So we will, we will, um, hope for good results that way. Pierre. Hello, sir. Good to see you. Becca. Hello. How are you? Claudia checking in from Virginia. Um, good to see you and Ray. Nice to have you. And Pierre says happy superb owl Sunday. Indeed. Emily. Hello. A snowy Sunday in Detroit. And I'm sorry. I talked about the weather here. It, it, Really, in truth, I was lying. It was horrible. We had sleet and hailstones the size of Volkswagens. It was terrible. It's terrible. Um, pretend I didn't say anything. Um, Kristen, hi. Good to see you, too. Barb Ann, hello, hello. Cliff, good evening. Who else we got? Sally, hello. Oh, checking in from the East Midlands. You know my wife is a West Midlander. I hope that doesn't mean you have to go to war or anything. As far as I know, the East Midlands and the West Midlands albeit having a few small rivalries and some football derbies are not in fact um, in open hostilities. It's not like North and South Korea or anything. Um, anyway, Sally, good to see you. Jeremy, good evening to you, sir. Always a pleasure. And I, I do like Tad the Great and Powerful, but I'm not sure I could pull it off. So uh, who else we got? Steve. Hello, Steve. Good to see you. And Ray, I think I said hello to you already, but if I didn't, no, I did but that's all right. I'll say it again. Hi, Ray. Um, who else have we got here? Have I gotten everybody? There's David. Hello, David. Good to see you. An old friend of Bruce's. Oh, we all miss Bruce. Everybody who is Bruce's friend, Mrs. Bruce. So welcome aboard. You are extremely, um, well, I already said it. Welcome. You are very welcome. Any friend of Bruce's is a friend of mine. Michelle, hello. Long time no see. As a matter of fact, I think the last time I saw you in person would have been at the Neil Innes concert. God, that's a long time ago. Oh, my lordy lordy. Okay, anyway. So, hi, Michelle. Good to see you. And Maria. Hello, Maria. There's a, a is it a new name or at least new to me here in the, uh, the readings? Anyway, well, very welcome, Maria. Good to see you. And Tim. Hello, Tim. Nice to have you back. Um, and with that, I guess I will start moving toward reading. Um, I was in the middle of reading last night when I had to stop because we weren't really at a good place. And I just kind of had to cut off in the middle of a chapter. We were reading chapter, what was it, 19? Yes, chapter 19, which is called Fragments. And um, what was going on was that uh, Rini was becoming more and more concerned and confused as to whether she had actually, she has actually stumbled onto something um, or whether this is, you know, just kind of like a paranoid nightmare, you know, um, as one does when enough weird things happen. Um, and that's the basic substance. Um, then uh, she's, oh, she had also had to contact her ex-boyfriend who had broken her heart some years back, um, a guy named Del Rey. So, uh, so the most of the characters in this part of the story um, are being referred to, if you haven't been 
up to date are Del Rey, who she has just had a phone call with, or a couple phone calls with, who is her former boyfriend who works for the United Nations, and she's trying to get him to help her find some information on the Mr. J's club and whether there's been complaints and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also Jeremiah Daco, who is the employee of Dr. Susan Van Bleek, who is Rini's old teacher, who was beaten and died of her wounds um, after Rini went to visit her with the uh, the golden gem that was given to them by a mysterious presence while in Mr. J's. Um, and that's basically going on what's... And so they're back in Susan's house and um, they are going through her stuff. Her, her um, office was just smashed. All of her equipment was smashed. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a blank moment here as I'm trying to remember what else there was I wanted to describe. Um, Okabu found a slip of paper crammed down behind a piece of furniture that has uh, a Tasco and early M written on it, a Tasco, A-T-A-S-C-O. And, um, so let me go back and start there where um, Kabu has just delivered this piece of paper. Um, and Rini has just had a look at it. It says, uh, it doesn't mean anything to me, she said after some moments. It could have been here for months, I suppose. It may be some other Irene entirely. But, uh, well, it also had Irene written on it, which of course is Rini's real name and what Susan called her. Uh I suppose it may be some other Irene entirely, but we'll check it out. It's something anyway. Jeremiah could make no sense of it either. Rini's momentary excitement began to fade. Kabu sat down, his face solemn. I saw the picture in the living room again as I passed, he said. The rock painting. He stared at the cup before him. For a moment, they were all silent. Rini thought they must look like they were conducting a seance. I am very sorry, he continued abruptly. About what? I fear that I made Dr. Van Bleek feel uncomfortable about the picture on her wall. She was a good person. She valued it for what it meant, I think, even though it was not the work of her own people. She was so good. Jeremiah sniffed angrily and dabbed his eyes with a napkin, then wiped his nose. Too good. She didn't deserve this. They should find those men and hang them, just like they did in the old days. She told us something important anyway, Rini said, and she may have left us this note. We'll do our best to find out what she learned, and if it leads to the people that did that... She paused, remembering the brutally impersonal thoroughness of the destruction below. Well, I'll do whatever I can do, whatever I can do, to see them brought to justice. Justice. Daco said the word like it tasted bad. When has anyone ever gotten justice in this country? Well, let's face the facts. She was rich and she was white, Jeremiah. If anyone's murder is going to be solved by the authorities, hers will. He snorted, whether in disbelief or agreement, Rini couldn't tell. They finished their tea while Jeremiah told them all the things that had to be done to prepare for the doctor's memorial service and how much of the work had been left to him. A niece and nephew were flying in from America, and on past experience, Jeremiah fully expected to be pushed aside without thanks. His bitterness was understandable, but depressing. Rini ate a few biscuits, more from politeness than hunger, then she and Kabu stood up to go. Thank you for letting us look, she said. I would have felt terrible if we hadn't at least tried. Jeremiah shrugged. No one will be punished for this, not as they deserve, and no one will miss her as much as I will. Something sparked in Rini's memory. Hold on. Jeremiah, Susan mentioned a friend named Martine, a researcher. I can't remember the last name. Deru something. Daco shook his head. 
I do not know the name. I know the house systems were purged, but might there be anywhere you could look? Did she keep an old-fashioned diary, a, a notebook, anything on paper? Jeremiah began to shake his head again, then paused. We have a household, a household accounts book. The doctor always worried that there might be tax problems, so we kept duplicate records. He bustled out of the room, his body language showing his gratitude at having something to do. Rini and Kabu sipped at cold tea, too tired to make conversation. After about a dozen minutes had passed, Jeremiah hurried back in carrying a leather-bound ledger. There is one small payment from three years ago, credited as research, to a Martin Desrubens, he pointed out. He pointed to it. Could that be it? Rini nodded. It certainly sounds right. Any net address or number? No, just the name and the amount paid. Well, it's a start. Rini fingered the, fold, the piece of folded paper, which now had the researcher's name written on it as well. Fragments, she thought, just bits of things. Voices in the dark, confusing images, names half heard. That's all we have to go on. She sighed as Jeremiah steered onto the dark hill road. Here and there, a glow through the trees showed the location of another of Clough's isolated fortresses, the light, as always, a display of bravery against the huge and frightening darkness. Bravery, or was it ignorance? Fragments. She let her head rest against the cool window. Kabu had closed his eyes. I suppose that is all we ever have to go on. Rini sat down on the edge of the bed to dry her hair, glad of a quiet moment by herself. The evening line for the shelter's communal shower had been long, and she hadn't been in a gossipy mood, so the twenty-minute wait had made her yearn for a little solitude. As she undid the turban she had made of her towel, she checked her messages. Someone from the poly had called to tell her she was summoned to the chancellor's office the next day, which didn't sound like anything good. She set her search gear to work on the two names from Susan's scrap of paper. The more she thought about it, the more she wondered why Dr. Van Bleek, who had spent her entire life working with information machinery, would make a written note instead of just recording a voice message on her home system. Perhaps there was more significance to Kabu's discovery than she had first thought. The gear turned up a match between Atasco and Early M, fast enough, a 20-year-old book in its third revision entitled Early Mesoamerica, written by a man named Bolivar Atasco. The first search through South African directories for Susan's researcher's friend's name was less successful, so Rini started a worldwide investigation through the online directories for net addresses matching or close to Desrubins, then returned to consider the Atasco book. As long as she was spending money she couldn't really afford, she decided she might as well download the book itself. It was a little more expensive than normal since it was apparently heavy on illustrations, but if Susan had left her some kind of clue, then by God, she was going to find it. By the time she finished drying her hair, it was on her system. If early Mesoamerica contained some kind of message from Susan Van Bleek, it did not immediately yield up the secret. It seemed to be nothing more than a work of popular anthropology about the ancient history of Central America and Mexico. She checked the index for anything that might be significant, but found nothing unusual. She scanned through the text. The color pictures of Aztec and Mayan ruins and artifacts were striking. She was particularly taken by a skull made entirely of jade and by some of the more elaborate stone carvings portraying flower-faced and bird-clawed gods, but none of it seemed to have anything to do with her problem. A blinking light brought her attention back to her other inquiry. Nothing had turned up about anyone named Martine Desrubens on any of the conventional international dic dic directories. Rini called the poly and accessed the school's much more comprehensive search engines. If she was going to get in trouble, she might as well get the most out of it while she could. 
and then returned to the Atasco book, hunting for anything that might connect the text or pictures to the mysterious city. She had no better luck this time, and began to doubt that the crumpled piece of paper had been anything other than some old research note of Susan's. She skimmed back, she skimmed back to the introduction and was reading about the author, Bolivar Atasco, who had apparently done a lot of interesting things in a lot of interesting places when her father returned from the store. Here, Papa, let me help you. She put her pad down on the bed and went to take the bags from him. Did you get me some more pain blockers? Yes, yes. He said it as though shopping were an un unappreciated, excuse me. He said it as though shopping were an underappreciated lifelong speciality of his instead of something he had just done for only the second or third time in his adult life. Got the pain blockers, got the other things. Those people in that store, they crazy. Make you stand in a line even when you only got a few little things. She smiled. Have you eaten anything? No, he frowned. I forgot to cook. I'll make you something. You're going to have to get your own breakfast tomorrow because I'm going to work early. What for? It was the only chance I could get for some uninterrupted lab time. You never home, girl. He slumped onto the edge of his bed, looking sullen. Leave me here alone all the time. I'm trying to do something about Stephen, Papa. You know that. She suppressed a frown as she pulled out a six-pack of beer and put it under the table, then hitched up her bathrobe and got down on her knees on the rough sizal mat to look for the vacuum sack of mealy flour. I'm working hard. You doing something about Stephen at your work? Trying to, yes while she fried griddle cakes on the two-ring halogen mini-range. Her father pulled her pad onto his lap and scanned a few pages of early Mesoamerica. What's this about? This whole book about some kind of Mexicans? These are the people that used to cut out people's hearts and eat them? I, I guess so, she said, glancing up. The Aztecs used to perform human sacrifices, yes, but I haven't had much chance to look at it yet. It's something that I think Susan might have left for me. Uh, he snorted and closed the book. Rich white woman, big old house, and she leaves you a book? Rini rolled her eyes. It isn't that kind of... She sighed and flipped the griddle cakes. Papa, Susan has relatives of her own. They'll get her property. Her father stared at the book, frowning. You said they didn't come to the hospital. You better come to the hospital when I'm dying, girl. Otherwise. He stopped and thought for a moment, then grinned and spread his arms, encompassing their tiny room and few salvaged possessions. Otherwise, I, I give all this to somebody else. She looked around, not realizing for a moment that he had made a joke. Her laugh was as much surprise as amusement. I'll be there, Papa. I'd hate to think someone else might get that mat I love so much. You remember then. He lay back on his bed, pleased with himself, and closed his eyes. Rini was just beginning to fall asleep when the pad beeped. She fumbled for it, groggy but alarmed. There were very few good things anyone might be calling her about just before midnight. Her father grunted and rolled over on the far side of the compartment, mumbling in his sleep. Hello? Who is it? Who is it? I am Martin de Rubin. Why are you trying to find me? Her English was accented, her voice deep and assured, a late-night radio announcer's voice. I didn't. I, that is... Rini sat up. She unblocked her visuals, but the screen remained black the other party choosing to retain her privacy. Rini lowered the volume slightly so it wouldn't wake her father. I I'm sorry if it seems like... She paused, struggling to collect her thoughts. She had no idea how well Susan had known this person or how far she could be trusted. I came across your name through a friend. I thought you might be able to help with... Might even have been contacted about... Some family business of mine. 
This woman had already tracked her back through her inquiries, so it wouldn't do any good to lie about her identity. My name is Irene Sulaweo. I'm not anything to do with their business or anything. I'm not trying to cause trouble for you or interfere with your privacy. She reached out for her pack of cigarettes. There was a long pause made to seem even longer by the darkness. What friend? What? What friend gave you my name? Dr. Susan van Bleek. She told you to call me? There was real surprise and anger in the woman's voice. Not exactly. Look, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't feel very comfortable talking about this over the phone with a, a stranger. Is there somewhere we could meet, maybe? Somewhere where we'd both feel safe? The woman abruptly laughed, a throaty, even slightly raspy sound. Another smoker, Rini guessed. Where is halfway between Durban and Toulouse? I'm in France, Miss Sulaweo. Oh, but I can promise you at this moment, outside of a few government and military offices, there is not a more, se more secure phone line than this one in all of South Africa. Now, what do you mean Dr. Van Bleek told you to call me, but not exactly? Perhaps I should simply check with her first. Rini was taken aback for a moment, then realized that this woman did not know, or was pretending not to know, what had happened. Susan Van Bleek is dead. The silence stretched for long seconds. Dead? She asked softly. If she was pretending surprise, this Martine, she was a gifted actress. Rini fished another cigarette from the package and explained what had happened without mentioning anything of her own involvement. It was very strange, sitting in the dark and telling the story to a stranger in France. To someone... Who says she's in France? Rini corrected herself. Who says she's a she, for that matter? It was hard to get used to this cloak and dagger stuff, but you couldn't take anything for granted on the net. I am very, very sad to hear this, the woman said, but it still does not explain what you expect from me. I don't feel very comfortable talking on the phone, as I said, Rini considered. If this woman was truly in Europe, she was going to have to resign herself to phone conversations. I suppose I don't have any choice. Does the name Bolivar Atasco mean anything to you? Or a book called Stop? There was a brief hum of static. Before I can speak with you further, I must make certain inquiries. Rini was startled by the sudden shift. What does that mean? It means I cannot afford to be too trusting either, entendu? But if you are who and what you seem to be, we will speak again. Who and what I seem to be? What the hell does that mean? The caller had noiselessly disengaged. Rini put down her pad and leaned back, letting her tired eyes droop closed. Who was this woman? Was there a chance she could actually help, or would it be just a bizarre accidental connection, a sort of drawn-out wrong number? A book? A mysterious stranger? More information, but no shape to any of it. Round and round again. Weariness tugged at her like a cranky child. It's all just bits of things, fragments. But I have to keep going. No one else will do it. I have to. She could sleep for a while. She had to sleep for a while. But she knew she would not wake feeling rested. Chapter 20. Lord Set. Netfeed. Religion. Clash shakes Islam's foundations. Visual. Faithful at prayer in Riyadh. Voiceover. The splinter Muslim sect who call themselves Surushin after their spiritual founder Abdul Karim Sorush had been banned by the Red Sea Free State, the latest Islamic country to take action against a group that is seen as a threat by many traditional Muslims. Whether this ban will prevent the Surushin from coming to Mecca as pilgrims has not been made clear. 
and many fear the decision could split the Islamic world. Visual, faithful on pilgrimage circling the Kaaba. The Free State Government claims that the ban was for the protection of the Surushin themselves, who have often been victims of mob violence. Visual, archive footage of Pre Professor Surush lecturing. Surush, a famous Islamic scholar at the turn of the last century, declared that democracy and Islam could not only be compatible, but that their association was inevitable. No sun marred the faultless blue of the sky, yet the sands sparkled with light and the great river gleamed. At a gesture from the god, the bark slid out into deeper water and turned against the sluggish current. Along the banks, thousands of worshippers threw themselves on... Whoops, lost the page. New book, pages don't automatically uh, separate. Along the banks, thousands of worshippers threw themselves onto their faces in supplication. A massive, ecstatically groaning ripple of humanity, far more violent than the sleepy motion of the river itself. Others swam after the bark, shouting praise even as their mouths filled with water, happy to drown in the attempt to touch the side of their lord's painted boat. The continuous and noisy worship, which usually provided a soothing background for his self-designed narrative, suddenly annoyed Osiris. It hindered his thinking, and he had chosen this method of transportation precisely for its slow and tranquil pace, to compose himself for this appointment. If he had not wanted an extended meditative interlude, he could have traveled to his destination instantly. He gestured again, and the crowds simply vanished, flicked into non-existence more swiftly than a man could swat a fly. Nothing remained along the banks but a few tall palm trees. The swimmers, too, were gone, the shallows empty but for thickets of papyrus. Only the helmsmen of the bark and the naked children who fanned the lord of life and death with ostrich feathers remained. Osiris smiled and grew calmer. It was a pleasant thing to be a god. His nerves calmed by the gentle water sounds, he turned his thoughts to the approach, approaching encounter. He searched himself for signs of anxiety and unsurprisingly found several. Despite all the times he had done this, it never grew any easier. He had tried in many different ways to restructure his encounters with the other, struggling always to make the interaction more palatable. For the first formal meeting, he had created an innocuous office simulation, more anodyne than anything he owned in the real world, and had filtered the other through the persona of a callow young employee, one of the interchangeable, interchangeable non-entities whose careers and even lives he had crushed without hesitation countless times. He had hoped in this way to make the other an object so devoid of menace that any discomfort of his own would be removed. But that early experiment had turned out very badly. The other's alien qualities had been even more disturbing as they forced their expression through the simulation. Despite the fact that the meeting had taken place in a sim world belonging to and controlled by Osiris, the other had warped and scrambled his avatar in a most frightening way. Despite his own vast experience, Osiris still had no idea how the other managed to disrupt complex simulation machinery so completely, especially since he very seldom even seemed rational. Other experiments had been no more successful. An attempt to hold a meeting in a non-visual space had only succeeded in making Osiris feel that he was trapped in infinite blackness with a dangerous animal. Attempts to make the other subtly ridiculous failed as well. A cartoonish simulation designed by programmers from the Uncle Jingle Children's program had simply expanded until it blotted out the rest of the simulation and filled Osiris with such intensely terrifying claustrophobia that he had been forced offline. No, he knew now that this was the only way he could handle the unpleasant task, a task that the other members of the Brotherhood would not even attempt. 
he had to filter the other through his own and most familiar simulation and construct as much of a framework of ritual and distance around the encounter as he possibly could. Even the slow journey up the river was necessary, a period in which he could find the state of meditative calm that made useful communication possible. It was quite astonishing, really, to think that anyone could inspire fear in Osiris, the master of the Brotherhood. Even in the mundane world, he was a figure of terror, a man of power and influence so great that many considered him a myth. Here, in his own created microcosm, he was a god, the greatest of gods, with all that such stature brought. If he chose, he could destroy entire universes with only the blink of an eye. He had made this journey dozens of times now, yet the prospect of simple contact, you could not term such interactions conversations, with the other left him as frightened as when he had huddled in his bedroom in the oh-so-distant days of his childhood, conscious of his guilt and coming punishment, no, no, conscious of his guilt and coming punishment, waiting for his father's footsteps to come booming up the stairs. What the other was, how he thought, what gave him the ability to do what he could do? All of these were questions that might have no comprehensible answer. There might also be simple explanations, as straightforward as the bioluminescence by which a firefly lured its mate. But it did not matter. And, in a perversely terrified way, Osiris was glad. Humanity reached out farther and farther, and still the universe pulled away. Mystery was not dead. The bark of the Lord of Life and Death glided up the great river. The burning sands ran unbroken to the horizon on either side. In all the world, it seemed, nothing moved at that moment but the boat itself and the slow rise and fall of the feathered fans in the hands of the gods' attendants. Osiris sat upright, bandaged hands crossed on his chest, gold mummy mask staring into the infinite south of the red desert. Set, the beast of darkness, awaited. From the air, this section of Oregon coastline looked little different than it had 10,000 years before. The pine and fir trees leaning in wind-bitten array along the headlands, the stony beaches accepting the ceaseless attentions of the restless Pacific. Only the helipad thrusting up from the trees, a halogen-studded circle of fibramicized concrete 300 feet wide, betrayed any sign of what lay hidden beneath the hills. The jump jet bucked slightly as a strong gust sheared in off the ocean, but the pilot had made landings on pitching carrier decks in worse weather and under enemy fire as well. A few slight corrections as the VTOL jets roared then the plane settled down onto the pad as gently as a falling leaf. A group of figures dressed in orange coveralls raced out of the low, featureless building on one side of the pad, followed more leisurely by a man wearing a casual blue suit that seemed to change hues slightly with every step, so that he flickered like a badly colorized film. The late arrival stood at the bottom of the plane's ramp and extended his hand in greetings, to the stocky older man in uniform who emerged from the jet. Good afternoon, General. Welcome to Telemorphics. My name is Owen Tanabe. Mr. Wells is waiting for you. I know that. I just spoke to him. The uniformed man ignored Tanabe's outstretched hand and headed toward the elevator doors, forcing him to turn and hurry to catch up with him. You've been here before, I take it? He asked the journal. Been here when this was just a hole in the ground and a bunch of blueprints, and a couple of times since. He punched at the elevator button with a stubby finger. What's the damn thing waiting for? Authorization. Tanabe ran his fingers over the array of buttons, a smooth practice moment like someone reading Braille. Down, he said. The elevator door closed and the car dropped noiselessly. The young Japanese-American man's further attempts at sociability were ignored. When the elevator door opened again, Tanabe gestured to the deeply carpeted room and its deeply cushioned furniture. Mr. Wells asks that you go in and wait. 
He'll be with you in a moment. May I bring you anything? No. Is he going to be long? I very much doubt it. Then you might as well get on your horse. Tanabe shrugged gracefully and smiled. Up. The door closed. General Yakubian had lit a cigar and was squinting with outraged suspicion at a piece of modern art. Multicolored electrosensitive gases housed in a clear plastic shell made from a death cast of an accident victim. When the door behind the desk hissed open. Those aren't very good for you, you know. Yakubian turned his look of disapproval from the sculpture to the speaker, a slender white-haired man with a lined face. The newcomer wore a rumpled antique sweater and slacks. Jesus, Samuel Christ, the general said. Are you going to start that stop smoking shit all over again? What the hell do you know about it? I must know something, Wells said mildly. After all, I'm 111 years old next month, he smiled. Actually, it makes me tired just considering it. I think I'll sit down. Don't get comfortable. We need to talk. Wells raised an eyebrow. So, talk. Not here. No off. No offense, but there are certain things I don't want to talk about within a half a mile of any kind of listening or recording devices, and the only place that's got more of them per square inch than this gear farm of yours is the Washington Embassy or whatever third world country we're deciding to blow the shit out of this week. Wells smiled, but it was a little chilly. Are you saying that you don't think I can talk securely in my own office? Do you really think anybody could penetrate telemorphics? I've got gear that even the government can only dream about. Or are you trying to say that you don't trust me, Daniel? I'm saying that I don't trust anybody with this. You, me, or anyone who might ever work for us. I don't trust TMX, and I don't trust the U.S. government, the Air Force, or the Emporia, Kansas chapter of the Boy Scouts of America. Got it? Don't take it too personally. He took the cigar from his mouth and regarded the wet, chewed end with distracted annoyance, then replaced it and sucked until the other end was glowing red. <coughs> Wells frowned at the cloud of thick smoke generated, but said nothing. Now, here's my suggestion. We can be in Portland in half an hour. I don't trust a conversation on my plane either, if that makes you feel any better. So we'll talk about the weather till we're back on the ground. You pick the part of town, I'll pick a restaurant in it. That way we know neither of us is running a setup. Wells frowned. Daniel, this is very surprising. Are you sure all this is necessary? Yakubian grimaced. He removed his cigar, then ground it out in an Art Deco ashtray that was being used for its original purpose for the first time in at least half a century. His host's flinch did not go unnoticed. No, Bob, I flew all the way here just because I thought you weren't getting enough protein in your diet. Damn it, man, I'm telling you, we need to talk. Bring along a couple of your security boys. We'll send them in the mine. We'll send them in with mine to make sure whoever, whatever, blah, start that again. Bring along a couple of your security boys. We'll send them in with mine to make sure wherever we pick is clean. We're just going to sit there with, with customers. The general laughed. Jesus, that scares you, huh? No, we'll clear them out. We can pay the owners enough to make it worth their while. I'm not worried about publicity, though, though we can throw a little scare into them about that as well. I just want a couple of hours when I don't have to worry about who might be listening. Well, still hesitated. Daniel, I haven't been out to dinner in I don't know how long. I haven't been off this property since I went to Washington for that Medal of Freedom thing, and that was almost five years ago. Then it'll do you good. You own about half the world, man. Don't you ever want to see any of it? To an outsider like the nervous young waitress who had arrived at work to discover she would only have two customers that night and now stood peering out at them from the relative security of the kitchen door, the man at the table seemed to be of a similar age, old enough to be looking forward to their first grandchildren. 
Very few ordinary grandfathers, though, had their table and chairs sterilized by a security team or their food prepared under the watchful eyes of a half-dozen bodyguards. The general was, in fact, a young-looking seventy, small and solid-bodied, skin darkened to coffee with cream from his years in the Middle East. He had been a wrestler at the Air Force Academy and still moved with a compact swagger. The taller man was also very tan, although his skin color came from melanin alteration, a shield against the aging effect of ultraviolet light. By his erect posture and firm flesh, the waitress, who was disappointed that she didn't recognize either one of such an obviously important pair of customers, guessed him to be the younger of the two. It was an understandable misjudgment. Only the slow brittleness of his movements and the yellow tint to the whites of his eyes gave any hint of the scores of operations and the painful daily regimen which kept him alive and allowed that life to resemble something like normality. I'm glad we did this. Wells sipped his wine carefully, then set the glass down and dabbed his lips. Every motion performed with meticulous deliberation. He seemed made of delicate crystal, like a creature from a fairy tale. It's good to be somewhere else. Yeah, and if our guys are doing their jobs, we can have a safer conversation here than we could have even in that hardened twilight of the gods bunker under your office. And the food was okay, too. You just can't get salmon like that on the East Coast. Actually, there probably isn't any such thing as East Coast salmon anymore since that infestation thing. Yakubian pushed his plate of fine bones aside and unwrapped a cigar. I'll get to the point. I don't trust the old man anymore. Wells' smile was thin and ghostly. Careful with that word, old. Don't waste time. You know who I mean, and you know what I mean. The owner of the world's most powerful technology company stared at his dinner companion for a moment, then turned as the waitress approached. His vague, distracted expression suddenly changed to something altogether colder. The young woman, who had finally worked up her courage to leave the kitchen doorway and come clear the plates, saw the look on Wells' face and froze a few feet from the table. The general heard her startled intake of breath and looked up. We'll let you know if we want to. Go sit in the kitchen or something. Get lost. The waitress scurried away. It's no secret you don't like him, said Wells. It's no secret I don't like him either, although I feel a certain grudging respect for what he's done. But as I said, none of that's a secret. So why all this running around? Because something's gone wrong. You're right, I don't like him. And frankly, all that pissy Egyptian stuff gets under my skin. But if everything was going as planned, I wouldn't give a shit. What are you talking about, Daniel? Wells had grown rigid. His strange eyes, bright blue set in old ivory, seemed even more intense in his expressionless face. What's gone wrong? The one who got away the... Subject, as our fearless leader calls him. I've been having some of my own people run a few simulations. Don't worry, I haven't given them any kind of specifics, just some very broad parameters. And they keep coming back with the same results. Namely, that it couldn't happen by accident. There is no such thing as accident. That's what science is all about. I've explained that to you enough times, Daniel. They're only patterns we don't yet recognize. Yakubian crumbled his napkin. Don't you goddamn patronize me, Wells. I'm telling you that it wasn't an accident, and I don't want to lecture. My information says that someone must have helped it to happen. Someone else in the, in the group. The old man himself? But why? And how, Daniel? They'd have to come in and do it right under my nose. Now do you see why I didn't want to talk in your office? Wells shook his head slowly. That's circular reasoning, Daniel. An accident is still the most likely possibility. Even if your sitmap boys say it's 99.99 .99 in favor of outside intervention, 
and I'm only assuming they've got the right figures for the sake of argument, that's still a one in 10,000 chance that it's a fluke. Nobody on my end doubts it was an accident, and it's my engineers who have to troubleshoot the thing. I have a much easier time believing we hit the jackpot on those odds, which aren't really that long, than believing someone from outside got into the Grail project. Another chilly smile. Or Ra, as our fearless leader is pleased to call it. Pour me a little more wine, will you? Is it Chilean? Yakubian filled the taller man's glass. Haven't been out of your goddamn bunker for years, and now you're going to get drunk on me. A century-old teenager. Hundred and eleven, Daniel? Nearly? His hand stopped, the glass halfway to his mouth. He set the glass down. Sorry. Hundred and eleven, Daniel? Nearly? His hand stopped, the glass halfway to his mouth. He set the glass down. Damn it, Bob, this is crucial. You know how much time and energy we've all put into this. You know the risks we've taken. That we're taken even as we speak. I do, Daniel. Wells' smile appeared fixed now, like something carved onto the face of a wooden dummy. Then start taking me seriously. I know you don't think much of the military, Nobody in your generation did, from what I gather. But if you think someone gets to where I am without having something on the ball, I have a lot of respect for you, Daniel. Then why the hell are you staring at me with that stupid grin on your face when I'm trying to get you to talk about something important? The taller man's mouth straightened into a thin line. Because I'm thinking, Daniel. Now shut up for a few minutes. The now thoroughly terrified waitress had been allowed to clear the plates. As she put down coffee for both men and a snifter of cognac for the general, Wells reached up and gently clasped her arm. She jumped and gave a little squeak of surprise. If you were lost somewhere and you didn't know how you'd gotten there and you didn't recognize the place, what would you do? She stared at him, eyes wide. I, I beg your pardon, sir. You heard me. What would you do? I, I, if I was lost, sir? And if it was an unfamiliar place and you didn't know how you'd wound up there? Maybe you even had amnesia and didn't remember where you came from. Irritated, Yakubian started to say something, but Wells flicked a glance at him. The general made a face and dug in his pocket for his cigar case. I, I, I'm not sure. The young woman tried to straighten up, but Wells held, held her arm tightly. He was stronger than his careful movement suggested. I, I suppose I'd, I'd wait somewhere, stay in one place so that someone could find me, like they teach you in the Girl Scouts. Ah, uh, I see, Wells nodded. You have a very small bit of an accent, my dear. Where are you from? Originally Scotland, sir. That's nice. You must have come over after the breakdown, right? But tell me, what if you were in a land full of strangers and didn't know if anyone would ever come to look for you? What would you do then? The girl was beginning to panic. She put her other hand on the table for support and took a deep breath. I would, I would try to find a road, try to find people who traveled a lot, and I'd ask people about places that were nearby until I recognized a name. Then I suppose I'd just stay on the road and try to get to the place that sounded familiar. Wells pursed his lips. Hmm, very good. You're a very sensible girl. Sir... Her tone was questioning. She tried again a little louder. Sir? He wore that half-smile again. It took him a few moments to respond. Yes? You're hurting my arm, sir. He let her go. She moved rapidly toward the kitchen without looking back. What the hell was that all about? Just seeing how people think. Ordinary. 
people. Wells lifted his coffee and carefully sipped. If it were possible to penetrate the Grail project and free this particular subject, and I'm not saying it is, Daniel, then who could do it? The general bit down, making the glowing tip of his cigar rise dangerously near to the tip of his nose. Not too damn many, obviously. One of your competitors? Wells bared his perfect teeth in a different sort of smile. I don't think so. Well, what else is left? You income? One of the big metros or states? Or someone from the Brotherhood, as we already mentioned. Possibility, because that, then they would have an advantage. Wells nodded, considering. They know what to look for. No one else even knows that such a thing exists. So you are taking this seriously? Of course I'm taking it seriously. Wells lifted his spoon from the coffee and watched it drip. I was already concerned about it, but talking about percentages made me realize that it's a bad gamble to ignore it any longer. He dipped the spoon again, this time letting the coffee pool on the tablecloth. I never understood why the old man wanted this modification, and it sure as hell made me and TMX look bad when the guy fell off the radar. I've been letting the old man handle it so far, but I think you're right. We need to be a little more proactive. Now you're talking. Do you think the South American deal has anything to do with it? He got awful interested all of a sudden in having our old friend taken out of the picture. Bully's been retired from the Brotherhood for almost five years. Why now? I don't know. Obviously, we'll have a, a close look when he brings back the specifications for the job, but right now I'm more interested in finding out where the hole in my fence is, if there is one. Yakubian finished his cognac and licked his lips. I didn't bring along that whole security squad just to clear a restaurant, you know. I thought I might leave a few of them with you to help out. Two of these guys worked at Pine Gap, and another one's right out of Critipong's Industrial Espionage Finishing School. He knows all the latest tricks. Wells lifted an eyebrow. He just walked out of Critipong, USA, to come work for you at military pay. No, we recruited him before he ever went to work there. The general laughed as he ran his finger around the rim of the snifter. So you're going to concentrate on finding out how someone got into the project and sprang the old man's guinea pig? If someone got in, I'm not conceding it happened yet. Could God think of what it could mean if someone has? But yes, that will be one of my lines of inquiry. I can also think of something else we need to do. Yeah, what's that? Now, who's had too much to drink? Surely, if you weren't getting a little fuzzy, a top-flight military mind like yours would see it immediately, Daniel. I'll ignore that. Talk to me. Wells folded his curiously unwrinkled hands on the tabletop. We have reasons to believe that a breach of security may have occurred, yes. And since my organization has ultimate responsibility... For the safety of the Grail Project, I must not grant immunity from suspicion to anyone, not even to the Brotherhood, not even to the old man himself. Am I right? You're right. So? So I think that it's up to me now, with your help, of course, since Telemorphix has always had a very warm relationship with government, to see if I can locate not just the security breach, but the runaway himself inside the system. And if in locating the fugitive, we also find out what it is that made him so special to the old man, and that knowledge proves to be harmful to our esteemed colleagues' interests, well, that would be an unavoidable shame, wouldn't it, Daniel? I love the way you think, Bob. You just get better and better. Thank you, Daniel. The general rose. Why don't we hop back? 
Those boys out there are itching to get to work on this. The tall man stood too, more slowly. Thanks for the meal. I don't think I've had such a nice evening for a long while. General Yakubian swiped his car across the window, card across the window on the counter, then waved cheerfully to the waitress, who stared out from the doorway like a cornered animal. The general turned and took Wells by the arm. It's always good to get together with old friends. And since that's the end of that section, though not the end of the chapter, we're going to stop there. Also because doing Yakubian's voice is totally ruined me. I should have thought of that before I picked that kind of a voice for him. Ah, oh, well. Anyway, um, 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 so I am going to wrap it up. I thank you as always for joining me, um, checking in and sorry, I didn't get a chance to say hello to every single person. Um, there's John. I know I didn't get to say hello to and Chris Vandal and may have missed a few others as well. And if so, I apologize. I apologize. Um, but in the interim, I will see you next week, either at the early Sunday morning, if you are of a kind of non-American persuasion, most of you, or at least non-West Coast, um, at 1 a.m. or Sunday at 7 p.m., which is, of course, this slot that you are currently visiting. And with that, I will say, take good care of yourselves. All of you, please take good care of those around you, your loved ones and your neighbors both. And I will see you very soon. So once again, thanks. Peace and good night.